Ladies and gentlemen, hello again, and welcome back to Don't Worry About the Government. My name is Chris Novembrino. I'm fiddling with the microphone. I'm joined here, as always, by Brian Halverson. How you doing, Brian? I am doing okay. It's a beautiful day in I like Texas. You, like, looked askance as I was introducing you. Oh, like, my yeah, goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it is one of those days where I, I have quite a few uh, landscaping chores to do. And uh, over the last couple of weeks, it's been in the, the high 90s. Oh. But over this last week, it's like, OK, uh, I it, it now makes total sense to just get out there and do this because it's just wonderful to be outside. Are, are uh, you, you're getting the fall energizing thing, too, because I, I very much get that. Like I, I was. I was too energized this whole week with fall coming in that like it screwed up my sleep schedule. And uh, even yesterday when I needed to play catch up on sleep, I was still like cleaning and stuff because it was easy. It wasn't hot. And I wasn't like feeling draggy and tired because of all the heat. Um, I really languish in the heat uh, at these days. Yeah. And I am a big fan of getting the windows open at least once a day. Uh, and especially in the... Uh as we are uh, around one another, I guess the ability to open the windows if you're in an office place uh, is sort of a big deal. Yeah, but unfortunately, if you're actually in an office, you usually can't do that because like shared allergy concerns and that sort of thing. I guess so. Yeah, yeah. No, well. but I'm, I mean, for me, because um, <laughs> I do teach like up here, uh, back, back, you know, usually off to the side here, there is this microphone stand with my regular mic hooked into that PA for singing lessons and that sort of thing. So I'm stoked that I'm going to be able to have that window open ish now. Like it ha I have it just open enough now where I'm getting some ventilation up here just to keep things cycling. You know, I'm not too, too worried about it, but you know, this is my teaching studio, but this is also my house and it's nice to be able to like ventilate, especially as we get into um, what, I, what looks to be a fairly rough series of winter months here. Um, that, like I, I I mean, you have to assume that this is not on the slate today. And this is not what we're here to talk about. You just have to assume that the coronavirus concerns are going to be substantial here, October, November, December. And, and I'm not seeing anything to suggest otherwise at this point. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just, uh, as we get into this, you know, just looking at the, the benefits of wearing masks when uh, we otherwise would not be um, – I'm hoping that this is doing something like historic as far as flu numbers. Uh, and um, I'm, you know, we, we can argue on whether or not a certain threshold is the right time to take masks off when we're inside. But uh, as long as we are keeping masks on inside, if we are saving some lives due to just the flu, uh, uh, I th think that's legit. Uh, I yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I mean, I had a student cancel this week, not because of COVID, but because of another upper respiratory infection. And it gets back to a broader problem here in America. Like, we still don't have a really great blanket PTO plan for people. Uh, we, we've been talking about essential workers now for a year and a half, and yet there is not uh, some sort of federal law mandating pto for sick days and that sort of thing which really ought to be especially during this pandemic really ought to be a policy prescription that's necessary um you have not really heard much clamoring among democrats including the democratic commentariat about a forced stimulus bill or even sustaining messaging from the left and the progressive wing of the party on this like we're Talking about this budget bill, talking about this budget bill, talking about this budget bill. Maybe it's worth it to just stay on the budget bill until we get that thing across the finish line. But at a certain point, and, and this should have already been happening, there needs to be a conversation on uh, for stimulus and additional measures for what is a prolonged pandemic that didn't just magically end on July 4th. Yeah, and uh, you know what? If, if we are stuck playing small ball due to the nature of Congress. Uh, these are the sorts of small ball plays that have to get played. Um, like for instance, the, the, the talk about uh, dental and vision being on a more comprehensive plan because uh, my teeth and my eyes are actually a part of my body. Uh, I, 
if 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 that at least isn't in the conversation uh i'm i'm gonna call shame on the progressives for not uh at least pushing that because that is something that i have heard from even an establishment stance is not really something that's defensible no uh god i could, I could go on a big screed about how like cinema and mansion have all these objections but none of these actual alternative proposals or like they, they, they've not been burdened at all in the slightest during this budget process with coming up with specific policy alternatives that they would like to see and then go to the public go on your meet the presses go on your cnn's with jake tapper go on these places where you are hailed as this reasonable philosopher um and explain to us these specific policy prescriptions that you would like so badly to do um they're not they're never even burdened with that uh that, that's that's a whole different ball of wax here yeah i guess you would first have to be burdened with that and uh that is I try to get to the point where I am no longer just focusing on mansion and cinema. I tr am trying oh, yeah. these to be, days. To be clear, uh, I'm I trying these days to, as often as possible, connect them as a symptom uh, of of uh, just as a mere byproduct of of a of a something that could otherwise have better been handled. Well, okay, so like let's think about this another way because you and I have been doing this long enough that we can actually kind of appeal to history that we lived through. The Democrats 10 years ago had nearly 60 votes in the Senate or, or right around 60 votes in the Senate. And what ended up happening to thwart the passage of the Democratic agenda then, was one a ridiculous obsequiousness towards the filibuster which is one of the reasons why when we were doing the democratic primaries i was so up a fucking flagpole about yeah the filibuster actually has to be a meaningful thing that we progressives want to move the party on because it has been a roadblock to progress and will continue to be a roadblock to progress some people didn't want to hear that other people have started to get the point behind that now um but so like that was one problem we like lived through that but then the other thing that happened is it wasn't a mansion in cinema there was you might remember this the gang of eights it, it, they 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 sit around their table in their robes <laughs> and, and a flashback <laughs> yeah 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 and, 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 and you know they I haven't heard that they, in a long time. they ruminate in, you know in like a hoary <laughs> smoky back room in, in, in you know emperor palpatine style robes discussing how they know better than all the rest of us dumb idiots um so i think if it wasn't mansion um and cinema uh, there would be a broader participate i i think to this point there are a bunch of senators in Washington who are upset right now um, on both the Democratic and Republican side that Manchin and Cinema are getting to have all the fun right now with the grifting. And well, as what we they have really talked want, about, yeah, you know, Collins is sitting about, on the sidelines yeah. wishing she could get in. It was a pretty quiet transition, as we have talked about, into uh, there was a moment of contention where it was exposed that almost a gang of eight were on the side of mansion and cinema and so if if you want to rebrand it it all it, it pretty much fits it's just that they're not employing the narrative it's it's yeah so i i, is I that actually, a back pocket narrative no i gonna, think that yeah. that's right i think that that's right like like if you know so i am very sympathetic to the people who say it's not just merely mansion um i even had a conservative friend bring that up to me last night he was trying to go in a different direction on it and i was like no 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 we agree uh it, 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 <laughs> yeah, it's just okay. it's just what like okay. it's what could you know here's the problem centrists are the most corrupt and, and republicans of course know this when we talk about Collins and murkowski uh god they'll tell you every single corrupt insider wheeler dealer move that lisa murkowski is doing that horrible person who uh, full disclosure i have donated 20 bucks to a re-election campaign after the kavanaugh thing um hey she did the right thing there she did the right thing there i'm gonna give her money for that um but uh yeah like, like i i think that the, the case is very clear that like they're the, sort of the, like the most corrupt um but like beyond that it, there's just no actual ideology there for mansion and cinema like mansion doesn't have a vision of how to govern to that point what what kind of leadership does joe mansion offer on our on our first topic here of the january 6th commission mansion's whole vision of civility and stuff essentially says and 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 i guess 
if if you are a mansion or cinema supporter, you need to just internalize this. That January 6th was no big deal. That right. it's actually well, quite okay to do that because the bigger thing that's far more worth it than standing up for the democratic process that the system was built around and just the broader concept of democratic feedback, um, you know, electoral feedback, um, civility. It's important. It's nice to be nice when it's time to be nice. Well, okay. The way that I'm going to sidestep answering your question, then this is my oh, boy. One. It's really this, easy to sidestep my questions because half the time they're barely even questions. Right. Well, th this is my favorite way to start a sentence as well. On uh, don't worry about the government. Uh, 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 the way that I'm going to sidestep this is by saying uh, Joe Manchin from day one has understood that he is never going to put himself into this position. And he also understands that he is of such consequence that he can tell Pelosi, I dare you to put me in this position. Uh, and you know what? The dare works. The dare is working. And the way that I know that the dare is working is that no one's saying it. So, uh, well, yeah. And like the uh, Senate has found a way to completely offload the January 6th stuff onto the house. Like, like, yo, know, we don't even want to touch this. We're pushing it to the house. And like, that does matter. The fact that there isn't really a Senate committee on this and that there's only a house committee, the fact that like and Biden's internal team, like the DOJ is not really touching this as much as they're just letting the house handle this. Like that is, that is lower tiering it. That is putting it in the clubs rather than the arena sort of move. You know, I, I hear that next week, uh, uh, Pelosi is planning to, uh, uh, call uh, Obama uh, the parliamentarian whisperer because of uh, his now we need to really reveal his exclusive ability to tame the parliamentarian uh, back in the Affordable Care Act days because uh, uh, I mean Biden he tried to do that back then yeah, it, the parliamentarian was just going rogue on him but then Obama, he had this chat with a parliamentarian, and then the next day it it was over. Uh, and that's beautiful. Uh, that's and, and, and and so uh, 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 the the thing that we're really missing here, and and it's it's too bad as far as Pelosi is concerned. Uh, it's really too bad that Obama can't be there uh, because he knew how to uh, really take care of the the parliament. Well, he could. Obama could become Speaker of the House. There's no law against that. Now, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to get there for totally different reasons. Now you shut down early. You shut down. Damn it. That's not fair. All right. All right. All right. All right. Let's move into the January 6th commission here. That's I, I, stung. I, I, look, I, I, I'm here to deliver bold and new ideas to the progressive movement, like really impractical ones. You can say what you want about Joe Manchin and Cinema. They don't have ideas. I have ideas. They're bad ones, but they're articulated. Um, all right. So this week, we are starting to get disclosures and subpoenas and documents. And like the January 6th commission is earnestly ramping up. One of the many reasons why I simply continue to maintain i do not believe it is fate accompli that the democrats are going to get wildly blown out in the midterm elections this january 6th commission and the fact that it's going to continue to coincide with trump announcing that he's going to run for president again there's a point where those two storylines converge and it's an unpalatable position for a lot of republicans especially as we start moving into the election um but what we saw this week was actually rather stunning. So there's a memo from a guy named John Eastman. You probably never heard of him, but he's a senior fellow at the Claremont Institute. The Claremont Institute is one of these D.C. think tanks. They're not like an irrelevant D.C. think tank. Like they are hosting Ron DeSantis later this month, among other things. Um, and they are... A, a place where a lot of legal thinking and legal scholarship for the conservative movement is done. Dr. John C. Eastman is the founding director of the Claremont Institute's career or Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence, hilariously, the senior fellow for the Claremont Institute until January 2021. What happened in January 21? Uh, he uh, served as the Henry Salvatore Professor of Law and Community Service at Chapman University. 
From 96 to 97, he served as a law clerk for Clarence Thomas, his wife, great human being. Um, after concluding his clerkships, Eastman took a position with Kirkland and Ellis in Los Angeles until 99, and then began teaching at Chapman University. Um, so this guy, who, again, founded the Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence, wrote this memo. And, and I give the resume as the setup here because you need to understand that this guy is a a vested intellectual treat. He's the type of guy, uh, not like a schlub like me in a Star Wars t-shirt. He'd get booked on Meet the Press. He'd get booked on uh, Face the Nation. He'd get booked with Jake Tapper. Um, first hand or f first name basis with a Grover Norquist. Grover sort. Norquist. You know, he would be at the cocktail circuits. The politicians might know who he is. You know, he, he could call a senator and that sort of thing. So this guy writes an, a memo leading into January 6th that details what should happen on January 6th. Let me read some of it. Step one, Vice President Pence presiding over the joint session or Senate pro tem Grassley, if the if Pence recuses himself. Here, I'm going to throw this up on the screen, too, for y'all. Um... Uh, they begin to open and count the ballots starting with Alabama without conceding that the procedure specified by the Electoral Count Act is going through the states alphabetically. So when he gets to Arizona, he announces that he has multiple slates of electors. And so he's going to defer the decision until finishing the other states. This would be the first break with that procedure set out in the act. But essentially, that little little do -si do move right there essentially stops the counting of the votes, which keeps us kind of in a perma limo here. At the end, he announces that because of the ongoing disputes in the seven states, there are no electors that can be deemed validly appointed in those states. That means that the total number of electors appointed, the language of the 12th Amendment, is actually 454. Um, which is short of 270, um, or, or would not be 270 to get to half. You would need, uh, you would need a majority of the electors appointed. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, here's where this gets really fun. So this reading of the 12th amendment has been advanced by Lawrence tribe who conservatives love to beat up, except whenever a tribe says something that they like to use. Um, quote, a majority of electors appointed would therefore be 228. At this point, there would be 232 votes for Trump and 222 votes for Biden. You see that? You see how that move works? Do, are you with me so far on that? This is so... Oh how how is like, like, this is uh, agonizingly thought out, Brian. Like, like this, this is what I'm saying. This yo, is, good, good, this good is for, not... <laughs> good for them testing the system. Yeah, but like uh, this so is speak. not like a shit post on I, Facebook. This is like no, an intellectual no. making a an intellectual who's a constitutional scholar. The guy is a doctor, a, not like a doctor of medicine, like a legal doctor, has a doctorate in law, has worked for law firms, and and is with a straight face making this. No, actually, subverting democracy would be really rad if we did it. Um, I mean, listen to the derision in, 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 in item number four here. Howls, howls, of course, from the Democrats, who now claim, contrary to Lawrence Tribe's prior position, because, uh, of course, us Democrats, we all listen to Lawrence Tribe, and we go, this man is basically our Moses. We, he, he says the words that we all internalize as the new commandments and edicts for what liberalism is. We get all of our liberal marching orders from Larry Tribe. That's how it works. I, I don't know if you knew that, but that's, that's I, what I, I do. I have to point out real quick, uh, the people who are trying this are the people who will go out of their way to make you understand that the Constitution is a dead document. Right, right, it, it, right. Th these are the people. I mean, this guy would, with with a straight face, tell you, Brian, that he's an originalist. He would tell you that he's a textualist. That that he believes in the original intent of the documents, keeping it to the letter of the text. Um, and this is whole cloth bullshit. Whole cloth subversive bullshit. Uh, if, if you thought that maybe Roberts was getting a little flimsy with his ruling on the ACA about what's a tax and what's a fee or whatever. Give, eh, give me a break on this shit. Like completely pulled out of the ground. And, and, and again, to, 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 to get to your point about this on Eastman, Eastman even knows this because he needs to keep appealing to Lawrence tribe 
because he knows that like without the tribe fig leaf here this stuff all just reads as completely fabricated original gobbledygook um so reading item four here howls of course for the democrats who now claim contrary to larry tribe's position which of course volunteerized that 270 is required uh, cause we like just think, oh, there's 50 states and you just <laughs> sum it up that that's what the math says. So Penn says, fine, pursuant to the 12th amendment, no candidate has achieved the necessary majority. And that sends the matter to the house where the vote shall be taken by the states with the representation from each state having one vote. Republicans control 26 of the state delegations and they win by a bare majority subverting the house, the house oh, like numbers. Okay. So, uh, uh- at this point at this point Pence saying fine um when you contextualize that with the nothing that Pence has said about January 6th like there is some sort of there is some uh, sort no of no this implica- is this is a good point like like Pence really has a lot of blood on his hands because he knew right. about all of this he clearly this knew is an implication if you know this even if it starts with hang Mike Pence you <laughs> man well he now is- hang Mike Pence has another has a has a different color because like a lot of those people in the crowd earnestly believed because people like Dr John Eastman constitutional scholar are are giving credit to this fucking fabrication they believe that there was a way that mike pence could have served as an agent of uh, of re-electing and reinstalling donald trump um and and so like it does color the hang mike pence thing as well um actually to that point right at the end of this even eastman seems to be kind of fingering pence here a little bit Quote, the main thing here is that Pence should do this without asking permission from either the joint session or from the court. Let the other side challenge his actions in court. We're Lord's tribe, our our Lord, our God, uh, who in 2001 could see. I, I love, 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 love. Because this is not unique to Eastman either. I love how conservatives really put a ton of like weight into Lawrence Tribe and Ian Milheiser. As though like these guys like really set the contours of how us liberals broadly think about this stuff um <laughs> we're tribe who in 2001 could see that the president of the senate might be in charge of counting the votes there we if tribe said it 20 years ago it's got to be right um and <laughs> others who press a lawsuit would have their past positions that these are non-justiciable political questions throw back at them essentially like to be clear what Eastman wants to hinge on is, ah, the Democrats are hypocrites, and they'll care about hypocrisy. Which, like, if the Republicans don't give a shit about hypocrisy, I'm not sure why we should. But beyond that, I don't know why I have to defend Lawrence Tribe's prior positions. It wasn't like I was... And no one asked me, Lawrence Tribe said this in 2001. Chris, how do you feel about it? And got my position on this prior to this. Um... I think he's probably wrong, to be honest. Uh, now, if you uh, can get away with this stunt, you do it. Like I hate, I hate to say that, but like if if you could actually, but there, it's no, it doesn't. Uh, this make is sense. no. To I think this really do, that lends like creeds to the people who say that Trump is the symptom and not the disease proper. Be, like or like, I, I guess maybe another way of looking I, at I, it is guess, like the disease is now spread so much deeper. Yeah, I, I I'm not for this happening. But when Pence has presented this, uh, this is year four into Trump. And the, I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't see Pence pushing back on this based on how the first four years or based how the first four years went. Uh, no, no. What, I, I mean, if anything, what, what the reason I wanted to do this story is that like this Eastman guy is part of the respectable conservative establishment. Right. The ones who wear suits and they don't use swear words. They go to country clubs. They 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 don't they don't talk about boobs they, or sex. They they're they're genteel. They're they're civil. Yeah, um, and when you yeah. do a deal like this with a person like this, Pence would be saying to himself. Well, the alternative is a deal more rooted in something that Trump wants to do that is so much more rogue than anything I presented right now. 
And I think a guy like Pence adds up that it's going to be one or the other. And I'm either doing it does, this deal man, right now really or I'm think. doing some future deal with Trump that is just so much more of a wild card. Pence really got cold feet over this. Like, like at the end of it, like you now think about how many different people were signaling to Pence, hey, go and do your job. And Pence, like, obviously he's a spineless coward uh, and he's not, he wasn't willing to go out. I, I really think it's cowardice. He didn't want to be the point man for this. Um, but it's really kind of amazing how much different kind of countervailing streams of pressure there was. Because, like, it's not like there's this massive divergence um, in, in tactical strategy between what the intellectuals wanted and what Trump wanted. It's, they're, they're basically the same thing. Um, they, and the idea that this was so... I think what's kind of chilling is how widely held inside of the party this no, 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 use every trick in the book to try to win this thing even after we lost this thing um, is now held. And I, I mean, it speaks, of course, to the greater urgency that we need for voting reform acts and stuff. A thing that Joe Manchin, the aforementioned Joe Manchin, has been opposing without any sort of clear alternative. Like, Joe Manchin, what would you do to ensure that something like this could never fucking happen? Or do you think that something like this happening is like, well, it'd be bad, but would be worse to be being mean? Like, you know, like, what, what would you do, Senator Cinema, to ensure that something like this could never occur? Or, or is it nice to be nice when it's time to be nice? Um, you know, like, it, I, I, I just, I, I it's kind of, it's hard to bear. Uh, it really is. Um, Speaking of hard to bear, let's let's pivot here because we, we do have to get out of here fairly quickly. Um, let's talk about the, the this horrible story this week about all these horses who are losing their job and having their pensions taken away um, and being maligned in the media for just trying to be horses. It's horrible. It's horrible. You know, I, I, and and you know. It's not a very nice environment to work in. And these horses are willing. A lot of are, these horses are really patriotic. I mean, they love their country. You know? Um, sure. They they have questionable views on race. They even talk openly about winning race. Which is, I mean, you know, like that. that's pretty out there. Uh, but they're horses. You gotta, you gotta allow them, you know... They Gotta don't let it. all kinds of horses do this sort of work. And that's, that's also true. It's also true. So, so anyways, um, like, um, uh, yeah. So, but sorry, my my student, my students here ten minutes early, and so I needed to tell him need to tell him to hold off here for a minute because I need to get through this segment. <laughs> yeah. here. Yeah, so. Yeah. What we're talking about here on this segment is um, we're talking about the horses, hit, horses. Well, no, like, OK, there there is a massive influx of immigrants down at the southern border, um, actually kind of like historic, like 10 year high sort of numbers down there at the border right now, uh, including uh, like upwards of 10. There were I think that started to disperse out a little bit, but like upwards of 10,000 uh Haitian immigrants or something like that or like maybe 10,000 total or whatever but it was like really all across um all across like the southern border especially around Del Rio and stuff heavy pile up um and you know it's a real you know you have an impromptu refugee camp essentially set up along the border and US border patrol was down there and attempting to do something in the neighborhood of policing um and what came, what leaked out are videos of some of these border patrol guys riding on horses. Um, initially, it was being reported that they were whipping people um, and people were like invoking uh, the fields overseers and that sort of thing. 
Um, the whipping does not appear to have occurred. At least there's no real kind of like corroborating evidence on the whipping. There was a swinging around of whip-like objects, which is still like not cool um, and not defensible. But I think like what is concrete and clearly objectionable um, is you hear on these videos, these Border Patrol guys making racist comments at these Haitians um, up to and including, oh, that's how you treat your women? Uh, yeah, I don't know if you caught that line. Like, they, they keep talking about, oh, you tr you guys live like this because you treat your women this way. Um, th like, that is a, a recurring theme from these Border Patrol mm. agents. Um, it's, y y so, like, yeah, no, like, they're raised, these guys are racist pigs. Um, I don't have any problem with the horses. Um, I, uh, that, that was just a joke about horse racing. Um, the, the guys riding the horses, they are racist. Um, and, and you know that because they're saying racist things in the videos to these Haitian, um, immigrants. Um, you know. For my part, like, look, uh, I am, like, a, a big softy when it comes to refugees. Uh, I think that America is a really, really, really large country. Um, I don't think we can take every single, every single refugee that comes into the country. But America is capable of taking in far more refugees than we do. Um, I think that it would... I think that we have a responsibility to some of these places to do better, um, in particular Haiti. Boy, boy, have we screwed over Haiti time and time and time again over a hundred years. Um, so, like, I, you know, I, I would want to see Biden bring, you know, bring these people in. Um, l let the conservatives, you know, kvetch about it by all means. Um, Instead, it appears that the Biden administration, you know, kind of like the same way they handled the kids with cages thing. They're like, well, we're not going to ride horses anymore. I'm sorry. It makes no difference if the racist yeah. thugs are in their car going or in a truck going. That's how you treat your women. Like, like it does car or horse. The problems that that's how you treat your women line in the swinging around of objects like I'm going to hit you. Yeah, the, the problem, number one, is. The the person who is doing their job professionally would best be served by having a horse. And number two, uh, the, the people who are saying this uh, are sort of getting a pass from getting uh, totally targeted because now the conversation is about, well, we took their horses away. Uh, so I, I yeah, really you know, what, what Saki really and Biden have this. done is basically said, but we've already punished them. Yeah, we punished the We people, already punished them. It's we, not, took it's, they, they, we took the horses. We took the horses away. Yeah. You, you also punish, like, like I, I will, I, I, in this case, I, boy, I'd like to say this is a the majority of the people doing the work that are on horseback are doing good work. And you just totally screwed that up. Uh, but what you also did is now we're not talking about the people. We're talking about, yeah, we got their horses. Like, uh, yeah, you know, in, in a way, yeah, I'm kind of I'm guilty of that, too, if the way I even opened up this segment. But I guess, like, to me, the story here is they blamed the horses and not the Border Patrol when it's not like the horses were the ones saying the racist shit. <laughs> oh, man. Unless oh. one of those horses is Mr. Ed. This reminds me of that scene in Blazing Topical Saddles. Reference. This reminds me of that scene in Blazing Saddles where he punches the horse out. Like, if. If this, if there was a racist horse, you you bring that guy, you bring that guy there. He takes care of him. But uh, I don't think that's the problem. No, I don't so think like it's the horses. The the horse story to me kind of gets into like my recurring mood on the Biden administration, uh, and it's this running theme of you can be substantially better than your predecessor and still not escape the not good range. Um, and, and so, like, yes, Biden is better than Trump on a, a wide range of issues, whether it's his response to China, um, whether it is his response to coronavirus. Um, even on something like this, he's better than Trump, but he's yes. still bad. He's still bad. But coronavirus, what? he's better than Trump, but he's still doing kind of a bad job on coronavirus. And in this case, I think it is up to the public to witness 
the media reaction to every single subject you can see how the criticism towards the biden administration is mitigated because well trump uh uh you know we we can't we can't push on Biden too hard because of the future of 2024. And, and it is not, it is not even about like uh, comparing it to, well, what if Trump would have won in 2020? The conversation also is, well, if we criticize him too much in any specific direction, we're giving the enemy red meat. And that is I, so basically, and then the flip of that is, I, I get from conservatives and Republicans all the time. Oh, I bet you love Joe Biden when he does this. And I'm like, no, I'm not like y'all. Uh, I, I, you know, I could go Biden is better than the alternative. Like, like I would rather have Anthony Fauci than Scott Atlas. But beyond Anthony Fauci, I'd rather anyone else than him is the primary messenger on COVID-19. But given the choice of Fauci or Scott Atlas... Fauci all day, twice on Sunday. No, like this is not. It, he's got many problems. Fauci has many problems. He's a problematic figure, but he's not Scott Atlas. Like it, you know, and yeah, and, yeah, yeah. If you, <laughs> we just brought this up a little bit before the show, but if you really want to see how the Republicans still pull punches, uh, look at how they're reacting to Hunter Biden as the artist, and how they won't really dig into hunter biden as a artist because the the underlying uh uh topic is you know george w bush it's george is, bush is, and or don jr like the hunter biden stuff is really kind of like a tough one for them to get on because okay you have george bush the failed painter um or failing painter i guess he's still doing it um but then you also have the guy who's most likely going to seek office again donald trump and his fail sons eric and don jr um and for as bad as hunter biden is it looks like don jr's on a similar arc as hunter <laughs> it, you know if you know what i mean <laughs> So, like, yeah, it's it's weird because I, I you and I were talking about this before the show. I, it continues to remain a point of dissatisfaction with me how the White House chose to handle the Hunter Biden painting stuff. But, again, it's like this, like, pulling punch thing. Like, you want to hit him, but you can't actually hit him on the real stuff. You can't hit him on the, you know, wheeler dealing for your son and giving him, like, advantageous deals because then we have to relitigate all the deals with China done for Ivanka and Eric and Don Jr. in 2017 when Trump first got into office. I mean, in a wide range of other issues beyond that. Um, so next episode, I, I we got to talk about, I want to talk about this fish story um, involving China and the fishing fleet. Um, but we're out of time for this installment of The Dispatch. Brian, where can people find you on the internet? At Postman Retweets, at Postman RTs. You can find the show at patreon.com slash DWATG. I know some people who have found the show here on YouTube already have went and signed up and subbed up on Patreon. Really cool. Thank you very much. Um, Buck a show is all we ask. 33 cents or 50 cents essentially per dispatch is what it sums out to be. Um, so if you liked this and enjoyed this and think it's worth two quarters, please. Go over to patreon.com slash DWATG and sub up. If you're watching on YouTube and you haven't rung the bell and smash that like button, please ring the bell and smash that like button. I feel dirty every time I say it. Uh, at DWATG on Twitter, on iTunes, on Stitcher. Search for Don't Worry About the Government. My name is Chris Nombrino. He's Brian Halverson. You are all the audience, and we thank you very much. Until the next one, bye-bye.